2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's turn in our Bibles today. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, we preach the message on as in the days of Noah and then as in the days of Lot. And today I want to bring a message I've never preached on before and God gave me these thoughts this week and uh, and it, it just seemed like there's a, maybe more than we can preach. We'll just go quick today so we'll preach fast and you listen fast. But I want to preach today as in the days of Moses. Uh, as in the days of Moses. I believe we have a parallel uh, to the days of Moses and the last days. Now for our text we want to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And I want you to stand with me. We'll read one verse today. And that will be verse number 8. Verse number 8. And then we'll have prayer and look at the message today. So you pray that we can... Uh, that these thoughts, might, the Lord might use them today. These are uh, very much exciting days we're living in, prophetic days, and, uh, and there's uh, uh, all, of the, uh, all of the areas of Bible prophecy are unfolding at the same time. All the events in the Middle East, all of the events worldwide, in, in, in so many areas of prophecy, but when we get into these areas like the days of Noah, the days of Lot, the days of Moses, we see many cultural and uh, 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 prophecies and social prophecies, moral prophecies and conditions that would parallel those times. Now in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 8, the Bible said, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. I pray you'll open into us the Scriptures today and give us these truths. And God, you know the hearts, you know the lives. There would be that one in our midst today who's not saved, who's not prepared for the coming of the Lord. They're not prepared for death. I pray that today would be the day they would make that preparation, dear God. And then they would follow through in that profession of faith Dear God, that we might go forward with you and not turn back and not turn to the right hand or to the left, but keep our eyes on the goal and put behind the things behind us and reach into those things that are before us that we might win Christ. God, bless this time in the Word of God today. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you today, and I appreciate that. 2 Timothy 3 is a, a very important prophetic chapter and I want you to notice verse number 8. The Bible now takes us and tells us that we would have a repeat of conditions as it was in the days of Moses. When the Bible said, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. The days of Moses, uh, we have similar situations in the last days as we have in the days of Moses. If you'll turn with me to Revelation 15 and verse number 1, again we have an interesting statement about Moses uh, that is connected to prophecy. In Revelation 15 and verse number 1, the Bible said, And I saw another sign in heaven, and great and marvelous seven uh, angels having the seven last plagues in them has filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of who? The song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are the works of the Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou king, of thou king of saints. So we have Moses now referred to and connected to prophecy in two areas. Now first of all, let's go back to Exodus chapter number 1. And I want to give you these rather quickly. I've got several I want to give you today. And, and you listen intently, listen very intently to the message today. Number one, the days of Moses were days... Were, were days when prosperity produced captivity. I want you to write that down if you take taking notes. They were days when prosperity produced captivity. 
Now notice with me in Exodus chapter number 1 and verse number 7. The Bible said, And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now this is a statement about the people uh, of Israel, God's people before uh, this time of Moses, the days of Moses. And we find that they were uh, greatly uh, 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 prosperous. They prospered exceedingly. Haven't we prospered? Uh, aren't we in a time and live in a, a nation of prosperity? Now you listen, you said, well, I, I don't have what somebody else has, but you've got more than most of the world has today. You can be sure of that, friend. Mark that down somewhere. You have more than most of the world has. I'll tell you what, we have been very prospered in America. But notice, please, that verse 8 said, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph, and this man now will enslave the people because of their prosperity. They were threatened by the prosperity of the children of Israel in Egypt, so a new king arose, and because of that threat of their prosperity and them being fruitful, they were captured and put into slavery, and they became captives. Now the Bible tells us that this would happen in the last days. Hold your place and we'll go back and forth. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter number 3, and notice please what the Bible said in Revelation 3 when we look at the church of Laodicean. We are in the, that, that age of time, the time of the Laodiceans, the last church listed of the seven churches. Here it is. And the Bible said, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, Revelation chapter number 3 and verse 14, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Look at verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knoweth not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Look at this, my friend. We have a prosperity producing captivity just as in the days of Moses. There's where we are today. You say, well, I'm not captive today. Hey, but be sure that the things you have don't have you today, Christian friend. Be sure that you are not taken captive by the material things of this world. We are not to do that. The Word of God said in Proverbs 13 and verse 7, There he is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. And there is that that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Turn me down just a hair, Brother John. We, we find that there's a danger any time you're prosperous. Prosperity is dangerous. Now I praise the Lord for it. I enjoy what I have. I thank God for what God's given me. And, and, and I don't think that's bad, but it is bad when those things take us over and when they capture us and when they dictate to us how we're going to live and what we're going to do. I tell you, when they take us away from God and when you become lukewarm and when you become indifferent to the things of God because of your stuff, then your prosperity has captured you as it did in the days of Moses. Number two, write this down. The days of Moses, going back to Exodus now, let's go back uh, to Exodus chapter 1 and verse 12. Number two. The days of Moses were days when God's people prevailed when they were persecuted. That's an interesting thought. Look at verse 12. The Bible says, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Now we have today, we have areas of the world that are being tremendously persecuted and Christians are being tremendously persecuted in many areas of the world. In Muslim countries, Christians are put to death and uh, they're arrested and sometimes beheaded and everything else for their faith. In Hindu countries, in India, Christians are being persecuted today. 
uh, uh, the story that we heard right in this pulpit. An Indian, uh, a national man from India told about how a lady uh, was in a revival, a tent revival in India, and her family came in and said, you either renounce the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and leave this tent meeting, or we're going to drag you out of here and pour gasoline on you and set your body on fire. And you know that woman would not deny the Lord Jesus uh, and she said, I'll not deny my Savior. And they carried her out and put gasoline and set her on fire and danced around her. Her family danced around her while she burned. You know what, my friend? Uh, but what happens when those things take place? Uh, his conviction falls upon sinners. And people begin to say, man, that woman has something I need. Uh, if she's willing to die for the Lord Jesus, uh, I'm not willing to die for my uh, false gods. You know what? We, God's people have always prevailed in times of persecution. God's people have always prevailed in times of persecution. Number three, the days of Moses were days when the lives of small children were destroyed. What about that? Now notice in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 16. Here we have a situation. The Bible says, uh, and he said, Pharaoh said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now this was a, a law now given, and in this law it was very similar to the law we have today of abortion. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, and it's amazing how a, a culture and a society I can I get so cold-hearted and hard-hearted towards uh, the innocent lives of little babies. I, I mean, it's just hard to imagine. Well, we that have children and grandchildren, uh, it, it, when you hold a little precious baby uh, in your hands uh, and look at that little child, it, it, uh, I can't get in my mind how anybody would want to destroy and would want to uh, chop to pieces that little precious baby. But you know what, my friend? Uh, the lives of little children are not valuable today. And we live in a day when they're being destroyed. Uh, and it's sad. You'll say, well, but man, I'm uh, what about the rights of the mother? What about the rights of the mother? Hey, what, when, when did anybody ever get a right to kill somebody? That right's not been given you, my friend. You know, uh, when I was preaching on Solomon, God showed me something on Solomon that, that I, I think is a tremendous truth to remember. Now remember, after Solomon prayed and asked God for wisdom, God gave him wisdom, and then immediately there was a situation in the kingdom where he to show his wisdom uh, to the nation of Israel. And what happened was there were two prostitutes, there were two harlot women, who had babies. Now they were, of course, unwed uh, uh, mothers, and these babies uh, uh, were not, they were illegitimate babies, but they had the children, and one night, and they went to bed, one of the uh, uh, mothers uh, rolled over on her child, and, and her child died, killed her child, didn't mean to, but what she did then is she took that dead baby and went over there and took the living baby from that mother and switched the children so that uh, this thing went to the court. It went to trial. They went to the officials about it. And the other woman said, this is not my child. Now, this is not my baby. And you know what? That thing, uh, that, that matter, uh, it made itself in, in the appeal process of that day until it reached the Supreme Court. Now, Solomon was the Supreme Court of that day. And what he said, we all know the story very well, what Solomon said to do is he said, bring me a sword. Bring me the living baby. I'll cut the baby in half. You take half the baby, and you take half the baby. Now what was the reaction to that solution that Solomon gave? The real mother said what? Don't do that. Let's let her have it. I'd rather this child live and her have the child than it to be killed, than it to be cut in two. I'd rather, even though I'm the mother, and I know I'm the mother, let her have the child. I don't want it to be killed. I don't want it to be harmed. You know what? Uh, don't you think that that would be a, a good mentality for us to have today concerning this abortion mindset 
that it would be better for somebody to take that child and raise that child than to have it cut in two in my womb, to have it destroyed in my womb. What would be wrong with that? What's wrong uh, uh, with that? What's wrong with doing that? See, the pro-abortion people do not tell you about the stress and about the anguish that these women go through who abort their babies. They don't tell you about the torment, how they can hear children crying and, and, and they can see their... They don't tell you about what goes on when they do that. They don't want you to know about what the, the price that people have paid their entire life for that. I remember reading a story about Patricia Neal. Patricia Neal was one of the old black and white actresses and she, um, she had a, a, an affair with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Cooper, uh, Gary Cooper, and, uh, and she, she got with child by him. And Gary Cooper uh, had her go and abort that baby. And now the article when they interviewed Patricia Neal, she was probably in her 80s, uh, and she said, I've regretted that every day. There's not been one day of my life since I aborted that child. There has not been one day of my life that I did not regret that I aborted that baby. What about that? You know what? Life was cheap in the days of Moses. Life is cheap today. We're talking about euthanasia. We're talking about a health care system now where there be boards of people decide who lives and who dies. I, I, no, thank you. I'm not interested in that. Life was very cheap in the days of Moses. And then uh, uh, let me say that uh, precious lives were destroyed. Uh, and I believe that this is part of 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. The Bible said that people be, would be without natural affection. Now we today uh, are looking at children. Children today are the ones that are paying a price for the sin of America. Did you ever think about that? Children today, uh, to start with, they're not wanted. I told you about the woman in Kentucky and they asked her, they said, would you have children again? She said, yes, honey, but not the same ones. <laughs> Amen. Children are not wanted today. Number two, most of them, a great majority of them are aborted before they're born. Some, after they're born, are thrown in dumpsters. Hey, little children are used today in pornography. Little children are used in perversion and molested. Uh, and we think about Mr. Sandusky, uh, who's in prison. Uh, you know what? That's where he belongs. By the way, a man that would desire little boys... Is sure a wicked outfit. And I believe a man to desire another man is too. Amen. That's wickedness. It's just wicked today. Hey, you know what? Uh, and our society comes along and we say, this man should go to prison. We, de we deem that as a culture and as a society as being a criminal offense. Did you know that 50 years ago, now everybody listen to me a minute, 50 years ago, did you know that in every state in the Union 50 years ago that uh, homosexuality was a criminal offense? Every state. Now we've changed our minds on it. All of a sudden we've said, we don't believe that's a criminal activity. We still believe it's criminal now if you do that to a boy. Hey, don't you think the safe way to be is not to do that at all? Would that not protect children more? Already we're hearing reports of Boy Scouts being molested and assaulted now as the Boy Scouts have caved in to this thing. Well, here we have the days of Moses. And uh, children are neglected today. Uh, they're not very precious today. And that's as in the days of Moses. Number four, write this down. Not only, is pros not only did prosperity produce captivity and... Uh, there was a, a, a persecution, but yet people prevailed in persecution. Number three, precious lives were destroyed. Number four, the days of Moses were days when God promoted people who feared God more than man. Why well, like that? Now notice in verse 15 of chapter 1, we have, the Bible said, 
And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one, uh, and we have these names here. Uh, the first one was Shifra. Uh, I understand the pronunciation of her name. And then we have uh, Puah. Now these are the two midwives. It's interesting to me that their names are recorded in the Word of God. These midwives. They, they tell me that there was probably uh, uh, hundreds of midwives in the land of Egypt and uh, throughout the history of the world, but yet God records the names of these two women. That name, uh, 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 Pharaoh, the Bible said, uh, 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 Shivra means beauty, uh, and the word Pua means splendor. We have their names there. Now notice what the Bible said. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was um, uh, 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 Philra, and the other was Pua, and, uh, and, and said, verse 16, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. Now in China, it's the other way around. China has a forced abortion law in China. And you, after one child, by law, you have to abort your other children. And because they want boys in China... They abort about 95% of the girls are being aborted. So you go to China, there's all these men there. There's no women. There's no women there for them to take for wives. That, that's going to be one of the things that I think will motivate China to come into Armageddon to try to take the world over so that they can, those men in China, they're going to have to go somewhere else to find themselves wives. Hey, that, and and we, we've sent our wealth to China with those kind of laws over there, that communistic, godless country that persecutes Christians, arrests Christians and put them in prison, has work camps. A lot of stuff we buy at Walmart is made by prison uh, camps where they've enslaved their people to build and make stuff we buy there. Amen. Go ahead and say amen, friends. Hey, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go ahead and say, I'd rather pay a little more and think that free people made it than folks enslaved. Now, notice though, I've got to hurry. Verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, uh, Why have you done this uh, uh, thing and saved the men children alive? And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and they and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well uh, with the midwives. Now I want you to get this point, please, because we have a law is given that these women are to kill uh, uh, the, the, the baby boys. Now, they don't have the technology to do this in the form of abortion like we do today. And had they had that, I'm sure that's how they would have done it. But instead, they wait till the child is born. Now, we have, uh, we have a, a, a sad situation here. But the Bible said they feared God. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare but whosoever put his trust in the Lord is safe. I want to tell you something today. You and I, we better not fear man. We better not fear man's laws. We better not fear those things contrary to the word of God. We better fear God, amen. And listen, whatever it costs, do right. Don't give in and compromise today. God, the Bible says that God dealt well with them. And the Bible said in verse 21, and it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. He established them in the land because they feared God more than the laws of man. Now the Bible tells us uh, uh, that he will do that today, that he still will promote those uh, who will fear him and honor him and serve him more than anything else. He said, but wait a minute. What about doing what's popular? What about doing God's will today? What about us junking what the world wants and the world thinks and doing God's will? Amen. Got a little quiet on me today. I, I tell you what, uh, I, I think you already got all the amens out of them, Brother Terry. Amen. Praise God. We need today to fear God. 
Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want you to turn back there a minute to our text that we took today. I want to show you what, uh, what Paul says here that's interesting to me when he's writing about all of these things that are going to happen in the last days. Look, notice with me verse 10 that Paul said, But thou hast fully known, and these are all the total opposite of the things that we've had given in the first nine verses of 2 Timothy. Uh, let, let me bring you in show you what we're talking about. And it won't take just a moment to read this. Notice back in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times. That means dangerous, also it means insane times. The word perilous is translated from a Greek word that means total insanity. Doesn't that describe our day? Perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, uh, uh, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. You know what? Uh, God's people are the enemy today. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For this sort are they which creep into houses and led captive silly women, laden with sin, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But I see these big egghead people on TV and they bring up a dinosaur bone and they say, this dinosaur bone is 400 million years old. Like you know, bud. Huh? If you wasn't back there 400 million years ago, you don't know how old that bone is. You say, oh, you don't understand. You're just ignorant, brother, do you? Don't you understand? They found that in the Plesopalapi uh, layer next to the Michaelokstigia layer. They come up with all these, every layer of strata, they come up with a big name. 400 million, 600 million, 100 million, 2 billion, 45 trillion, blah, blah, blah. Hey, that crowd's on drugs. So, they, found a, they find a bone in a certain layer, and they say, the bone is 400 million years old. How do you know it's 400? Because it's in that layer. And that layer is 400 million years old. How do you know that layer's 400 million? Because it's got a bone that's 400 million years old. Are y'all with me? That's called circular reasoning. And listen, friend, what about there? What about this? Is what the Bible said? God made those things, <laughs> huh? God made them, and and. And a flood came along. Struck, but anyhow, I can't get on that today. We will be here till, till a long time. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Is that not our day? We've got more education, but we've got more problems in society. We've got more... I, look at all the advancements we have in medicine today. But is there not more weird things? Is there not more people sick? Is there not more... I mean, the more we learn, the less we come to the knowledge of the truth. I mean, all in our culture and our society, we've got, uh, it seems like problems that cannot be solved today. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now, as Janes and Jambes withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto them unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known, now notice, we got nine things here that I want to uh, 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 count them. Number one, thou hast fully known my doctrine. Number two, my manner of life. Number three, purpose. Number four, faith. Number five, long-suffering. Number six, charity. Number seven, patience. Number eight, persecutions. Number nine, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconom, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, yea, I, I, but out of them, but what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord, what? Delivered me. I'm telling you, God will bless you if you'll put Him first. God will bless you if you honor Him above man, above man's laws and man's ways. 
God will do what it, for you what he did for the midwives in Egypt. He'll bless your life. And I'll tell you, I like the blessings of God. Now, number five, I want you to write this down. Now, this will be an encouragement today, I think. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 2. And this will be, we'll, we'll, we'll finish this message next Sunday morning, okay? So I'll give you this point and we'll close. Number five, not only were they days, the days of Moses, where prosperity produced captivity, where God's people prevailed in persecution, where precious lives were destroyed. Number four, where God promoted people who feared God more than man. Number five, write this down, the days of Moses were days when the principles of God taught to young children bore great fruit. And I like this point of the message. Now what do we have in the book of Exodus? This story uh, of Moses is one of the great marvelous stories of the ages concerning this great man, Moses. He, he's one of the greatest men of history. He's in the top five greatest men in world history. No question about it. Jesus being number one. And then you then you would have you'd be very hard to decide between Abraham and Moses and David, uh, who would be, uh, the order would be in the next three greatest men all time in world history. And by the way, he didn't come from a monkey, amen? But notice that, uh, that this man, Moses, now remember the story, how that the law commanded that he be destroyed, but they didn't obey that law. His mother and dad and family hid this child for three months. And then they realized that they could not hide him much longer. And so by faith, as Noah by faith built an ark, so did the family of Noah. By faith, they prepared an ark to the saving of the life of Moses. And they made it out of the reeds, uh, uh, the, the papyri that grow there, and wove this together, and they sealed it and waterproofed this little, this little ark, this little boat. Uh, and they and prepared it, and of course, I'm sure, put blankets in there and made it comfortable and maybe put a little rattle thing in his hand and all of that. And they lay Moses in that boat and put it out to float in the river. I mean, man, you're talking about trusting God. And it goes out, and down the river it goes. And there goes the sister of Moses walking around the river bank. She's watching this little uh, basket and God brings it right up to the shore where the daughter of Pharaoh is washing herself and she's there with her maidens and uh, it comes in and they have an interest in this little, uh, this little ark, this little boat that's come in and they go over there and when they pick the lid up and look in there, the Bible said the baby wept and it touched the heart of the daughter of Pharaoh and she fell in love with that little baby. And my friend, uh, I, I said, he'll be mine. I, I'll raise him as my son. He said, what am I going to do about nursing this baby? And Moses' sister said, I know what we can do. Ma'am, I know what we can do. I know somebody can do it. Now, that period of time, and we're not sure what it was, but I'm thinking it's a couple years. That period of time where they carried Moses to his mother for her to nurse him. I want you to always remember this about that. That she not only did she nurse him physically, but she nursed him spiritually. And it had a tremendous impact upon his life. If you today have a godly mother, a mother that taught you about Jesus and prayed for you and taught you right from wrong and discipline you, you need to thank God. You young people, if you've got that kind of mother, you ought to go home and thank her and say, thank you for being a good mother. If you don't have that kind of mother, you need to pray for your mother. She'll be that. Now, I want you to look with me in Acts chapter 7. Stephen tells us something about this. The power and the influence that the mother of Moses had on him was absolutely amazing. Because he will be raised in the occultic, satanic, demonic, and idolatrous ways of the mystery religions that permeated all of that part of the world at that time. I wish I had time to go back and teach you about the mystery religions that originated with uh, there in Babylon uh, and uh, Nimrod and, and, and all of that and Tammuz and all those things, how that spread throughout the world, that 
worship of, of, uh, uh, of a polythe poly gods where you had uh, many gods, men and women gods, married couple gods, gods over everything, gods of fertility, gods of rain, gods of... I mean, they had all of that, that mystery religions, uh, how all that took place. And notice in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was preaching his famous sermon, he made a reference to Moses in Acts chapter 7 and verse number 20. The Bible said, In which time Moses was born and was exceedingly fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, uh, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now look at verse 22. And Moses was learned in what? In all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. I want you to underline that. All of the wisdom of the Egyptians, this boy was thoroughly indoctrinated into the new age, occultic doctrines of the day. But you know what? That message and that instruction of his mother, thank God prevailed over all of that indoctrination of the new age of that time. Praise God. You mothers, you better, you better remember this message today, Mom. You better think about it, ma'am. Uh, as God gives you children, the power that God gives you, the influence God gives you to train and to rear and to raise your child for God and instill in them the things of the Lord and a godly heritage and a goodly heritage. You better not forget this today. You have an opportunity as no one else has in the world. Now, I praise God for godly dads that will teach your children I didn't set an example, but I'm telling you a mother has the influence over a child that is unparalleled in life. The Bible says, and I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 11 now, and let's notice how amazing this is. Again, we have a reference. As I said, don't, don't get nervous. I'll finish this point point. we'll go home, okay? Get the invitation. I've got some other things that's really interesting I want to give you. I don't, I don't want to just rush through it. Hebrews 11, I love these scriptures about Moses. The Bible said in verse 23 of Hebrews 11, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parent because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming, desiring, or looking at it in a desirable way, the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured his seeing him who is invisible. And through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Now these are amazing truths about Moses. How that, that instruction of his mother uh, uh, bore tremendous fruit. And I want to encourage you mothers today. I, I, I want to encourage you. you you've tried to uh, be in church and have your children in church. They may not be where they need to be right now in their life. But I'm telling you, friend, uh, uh, God promised that, uh, uh, that His Word would not return to Him void. It had accomplished that which He pleases. It will prosper in the things whereto He sends it. I tell you, you bathe now that instruction in prayer and you be an intercessor for your child now as they're growing up. Maybe they've gone away. Like Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll what? Not depart from it. Amen. Aren't you glad for those? Uh, Paul said in Ephesians 6, 3, And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The days of Moses were days, it seemed like the world was, was, uh, had gone berserk. The devil had just taken over, hadn't he? Don't you feel that way today? Doesn't it look like the devil has just taken over? Yet God honors that fruit. God honors that instruction and that example. Oh, it's not in vain for you to pray and have family altar. It's not in vain for you to teach your children about God. It's not, 
Hey, it's not in vain for you to live a separated life for God. It's not, hey, your children ought to see you moms. Uh, they ought to see you in the Word of God. They ought to hear you pray. We used to sing a song. We don't sing it anymore. If I could only hear my mother, what? Pray again. Don't sing that, do we? You know, hey, I'm going to tell you something. This, this, uh, all this trashy bunch on TV and stuff, I, that, they're not about praying. That's, that's setting the example today, people, how they live and how their homes should operate in a bunch of liquor and parties and immorality like alley cats out here and, and just a bunch of filth. and dirt. Oh, they've got the big diamonds and they got the night. They got all the clothes. They got all that. I want to tell you something, my friend. It's low down sin. It's what it is. Well, thank God for that wise woman who built her house. And that's what the mother, won't it be a blessing one day when we get to heaven to meet the mother of Moses? She was a woman of faith, wasn't she? Took a lot of faith to set that little ark out there to float, didn't it? Not knowing what would happen. And in a few hours, here comes the sister of Moses running with that baby. Here he is, Mama. They're going to hire you and pay you to nurse this baby. Praise the Lord. Boy, I can see her, folks. I can see her, that little child as he's growing up, saying, Moses, you were born for a purpose. God's got a will and a purpose for you. You're not like other children. You're not, you're not supposed to be out here in all this worldly stuff. God wants you to be a man of God. God wants you to do His will and His work. God will prepare you to do that. Oh, you're somebody special. Let me tell you about your dad. And your granddaddy, let me tell you about your forefathers, about, uh, uh, about Levi, and about Jacob, and about uh, Isaac, and about Abraham. Let me tell you about, hey listen, there's something expected of you. God's got something for you. And you know what, in the midst of those days, that instruction produced tremendous fruit. Oh, let's pray for that today, in these days, that God will give us that today. Let's bow our heads. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.